story uh, about a man of God, and uh, believe it or not, he irritated other people sometimes. And uh, there were some political leaders who didn't particularly care for this guy, that they didn't really know what to, to do with him. In fact, finally they just arrested him and put him in jail. And uh, so they got this big party going on, and uh, the leader has a stepdaughter, and she gets up and she dances beautifully at this thing. Everybody just, oh wow, oh wow, it's just so great. And, and he stands up and says, hey, you can have anything you want. Just tell me what you want. He said, I want the head of that man that's in prison on a platter mm -hmm. and brought to the party. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh oh. Yeah. Yep. And um, so this is about a guy that died, but it's like, I mean, how did he die? You know, this horrible place to hit just... He became the party figure of a bunch of drunks. And uh, anyway, um, John chapter 14, verse 12 and 14. John's disciples came and they took his body and, and they buried it. And then they went and they told Jesus. Understand, this was his cousin. This was his forerunner. This was a prophet of God. And so it hit home because of who he was, not only uh, ministerially, so to speak, but family-wise as well. This is his cousin. And especially the horrible way that his passing occurred. And it said, and Jesus withdrew by boat privately into a solitary place, which is a very natural human response, I think, when things like this happen. It's like, I just need to get away and kind of process what's just happened in my life. I've lost something. And hearing, hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. He's in a boat going across the lake, and they decide to walk around. And when Jesus landed, there's a large crowd there. He's trying to have a little long time. Because he got a little bit on the boat, but that's about it. When Jesus landed and he saw the large crowd, he had compassion on them and he healed their sick. Now that is a missional response. While he's trying to have a normal human response. Amen. And as I was reading this passage, I did not realize this. That day, that was the day that after he's prayed for the sick, these people have come, he's prayed for the sick, his, his disciples come and said, send everybody away. Everybody's getting hungry. And all that. He said, no, you feed them. Right. Yep. Like, well, we've got you know, just a little bit of food here. He said, bring it here. Be blessed to be broken. And out of all of this, on the same day, a miracle happened. A miraculous thing happened in spite of the horrible thing that had just, had just occurred. And what I saw in that is Jesus, who was tempted at all points like us, he, is a, he was a human being as well as the Son of God. And so he felt things very strongly. And, and he was in that kind of a place of the loss of a family member. And yet, what happened was, the mission was still there. He was still a healer. And so he still healed the sick. And not only that, he did a very miraculous thing. I'm praying for this church for some very miraculous things to happen. Amen. Yeah. Okay? Because the mission has not changed. Absolutely. Amen? Amen. Amen. All the things, the confessions, your things that you're saying this church is and is going to be doing, all of that, I would pray is going to be multiplied many times over. Amen. In Jesus' name. So, uh, you know, when Jesus was uh, asked one day by his disciples, uh, teach us to pray like John, the guy we're talking about, John the Baptist, he's, you know, he, he taught his disciples to pray, gave them special prayers, showed them how to do it. To tell, teach us how to do that. And uh, what's, it's what we call the Lord's Prayer. And I don't think it's the Lord's Prayer. I think actually probably 
John chapter 17, that priestly prayer that Jesus yeah. prayed. This was actually our prayer. We call it the Lord's Prayer, but it's our prayer. I grew up as a Methodist. Something I said every Sunday morning for the first like 20 something years of my life. It was just part of the church service. Let's all stand and repeat the Lord's Prayer. And, yeah. and, and I'll be very honest with you, I could do it backwards, forwards, eyes, closed. You know, probably didn't mean very much when I was saying the words. Okay? And uh, that's kind of, I, I, as I thought about that, I thought about the prayer, and, and of course, I, I thought a lot more deeply about it since that time. The first two words, it just every time I hear it, it's revelation again. He says, pray like this, our Father. So he's talking to God, not as, oh God, omnipotent, all powerful. He's our Father. And not only that, he's our Father. He's my father, and he's your father. And he's inviting them into his family in this prayer that you need to be thinking about this. That's who we are. So we're saying that. And then, of course, there's the, the very first part is where we honor God. You know, uh, our Father, our heaven, hallowed be thy name. One, one translation put it this way. I liked it. May the glory of your name be the center on which our lives turn. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah. That actually means a little bit more to me than how it would be thy name. Because growing up, I think I have no idea what that is. <laughs> but I know it. I know the word. I just, what the, maybe what does that mean? So before we and, and before we start asking for stuff, give us our daily bread, give us our sin, you know, all of our, our personal stuff. Before all that, he said, now, after you, our Father, and we honor God, this is what main thing I want you to pray Thy kingdom come, and your will be done on earth like it is in heaven. Yeah. And before we start asking about stuff for us, yeah. let's, let's talk about, let's pray for His stuff, mm -hmm. His kingdom. And so, as I thought about that, how does that actually happen? I mean, you know, we say these things, and it's like, how does His kingdom come, and His will be done on earth like it is? How, how, how does that actually work? And, and this is the revelation that I've got so far out of this. Um, I believe that every time someone in the world asks Jesus to be the Lord of their life, the kingdom of God comes. Right. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good word. In a new way. Yeah. Yeah. There's one more person where the kingdom of God has now become, the kingdom of God is within you, Jesus said. He yes. told you know, that when they invite that the presence of Jesus to come into their life, forgive them of their sins, and so forth. Every time that that happens, the kingdom grows. Yes, it does. It's not like some ethereal thing, going, we're praying for your kingdom, and the come down, or like some castle coming out of the sky. I don't think he's talking about that. I think he's talking about us. Yes, sir. He's talking about human beings. And he wants it done on earth, as it is in heaven. And uh, I thought about that one. Thy will be done on earth like it is in heaven. Hopefully, every time somebody says yes to Jesus, there's a greater possibility that the will of God is going to be done by one more person yes. on this earth than it would have been before Amen. they met Jesus. Yes. So I'm thinking it's not maybe this complicated, maybe it's just this simple thing that we all have done, talking to somebody, praying with them, leading them to Jesus, that sort of thing. Every time we did that, the kingdom came and the possibility of the will of God being done on the earth like it is in heaven, it becomes greater. Right. Yeah. Good. Okay? Say it. It's not some sort of anointing that's going to come down on all the bad people and all of a sudden I'm going to do everything Jesus wants me to do. Mm -hmm. Only when they give their life to Jesus, that's supposed to be happening. Yes. Is your life any different now since you met Jesus than it was before? Is more of the will of God being done on the earth now because you be said yes to Jesus? Should be. Absolutely. And every time that happens... And you need to understand, probably since I've been talking, there's probably been several people somewhere in the world who gave their life to Jesus while we've been here. Yeah. 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 So the kingdom has grown while we've been sitting here. Right. Right. And the possibility of the wind. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Stop, man. This is my definition. It would seem to be a human decision that's met by a divine encounter that produces the capacity. For a changed life based on the teaching of Jesus, who is the Word of God, and is energized by the Holy Spirit. Yeah. 
That's the same thing as saying somebody got sick. But that's, that is the mechanism which I think about stuff like this. How does this actually work? It, it requires the human decision. Tom Fox has led hundreds of people, thousands of people to the Lord, but it came one at a time. It's one person making a decision. Yes. 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 Right? And when they made that decision, there was a, it was met by a divine encounter. God said, I'll, I'll see you there. Mm -hmm. And now, as you grow in God, you hear the word of the Lord, the Holy Spirit will work with you. It's changing your life. Yeah. It's like the, the more time I spend with God in His word, in church, in worship, in prayer, whatever it is, there's the possibility of the things, the kingdom growing. It's growing inside of me, therefore it's growing in the earth. Right? Right in the world, salt in the earth, right? That's yeah. who we are. So, in the words of Jesus, you, you got to be born again, or you got to be born from above. That's several different ways. And the Bible declares us to be new creations in Christ, where all the past, the old things have passed away, and all things have become new, and it's filled with the promise, new beginnings, second chances, and fresh starts. Whichever people in the world need all those things. We are we are carrying something that everybody in this world needs. Yeah, right. Amen. I promise you, everybody needs this. Absolutely. So I don't care I don't care about how much money they make, what the position in the world is, everybody needs those same kinds of things. Yeah. Now it says in in Colossians chapter one, verses twelve through fourteen, giving thanks to God, who's qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. And he's delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. And Paul describes this transaction as being actually delivered out of one kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light or the kingdom of His dear Son, Jesus Christ. It's like, I used to live here and now I live here. I may geographically have it moved, but I have moved. Something has changed. I'm now a citizen of another kingdom. Right. I was a part of it. I was a part of an old kingdom. And I lived it out. And I followed their rules. And I acted like they did. And all of a sudden now I come into a new place. And it's a it's a kingdom of light. It's the kingdom of his dear son. And once again, he invites us in. You come on in with my son because right. you're like my kid now. You're part of my family. And that's what he taught us to pray. I like this one in Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 through 29. It said, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. You are all, all right. sons of God, sons yep. and daughters of God through our faith in Jesus Christ. For as many as were baptized into Christ and put on Christ, there's neither Jew nor Greek, which is religion or nationality. There's neither slave nor free. It's not about what class you're in. There's neither male nor female. There's no, no sexual orientation stuff there. For you all one in Christ Jesus. And if you're Christ, then you're Abraham's seed and you're heirs according to his promises. So this is the kinds of things that God says happens to us actually when somebody gives their life to Jesus Christ. All, I like that. We're all sons of God through our faith in Jesus Christ. Yes. I have to, I'm, I, some days I need that more than others. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we know in part, we prophesy in part. That's just on my good days. <laughs> <laughs> Which means there's room for growth for all of us. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and that moves us from being orphans to being sons and daughters of a great father. And what it says here, it's not about race or nationality, religious, religious affiliation, or male or female. It doesn't make any difference. And the church has done in the past sometimes a horrible job of not fulfilling that. Mm -hmm. We put people in classes. We put people, well, you're women, you can't do it. You're, you're, you can't do it. You know, you're from this country. You're, you, whatever it is, we've, we've done a horrible job in all those things. Because the really only thing is, are you in the kingdom of darkness or are you in the kingdom of light? If you're in the kingdom of light, you're, we're like all brothers and sisters. You're all sons of God. Okay? I mean, God's treating us all like that the same way. That's what He wants. And it's finally about coming out of a dark place, a dark kingdom, and the kingdom of light, 
in real life. Uh, it, and I, I just, I'm going to read this story. A man shared this recently, and, and it just intrigued me what, what he said the Lord said. He, he read this scripture. It's Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 36. It's a story of what we call the story of the Good Samaritan. Okay, it's a great story. He said, I read it through, and he said, oh, Lord, I see that. Lord, I see I need to be. I don't want to be like the Pharisees anymore. I read that. That's it. Read it again. And he just kept going. Every time he would read it, he'd see something new. Read it again. Read it again. Read it again. Finally, I think God showed him some things that he was trying to say. Because it, well, let's just read it straight. Uh, verse 25, Luke 10, 25. Behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Father, teach, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he's testing him. So this is not actually a totally sincere thing. It's just checking him out. He said to him, what Jesus said, it's just great. How many times Jesus <coughs> will answer a question with a question? And see, what he's trying to get you to do is you to think. Right. He's not trying to produce robots. He's trying to get people to be use the creativity of their own brain and, and do something they don't want to do, which is actually think. They don't want to do. He said, what is written in the law? What is your reading of it? So he answered and he said, uh, okay, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said, very good. You've answered well. Do this in your life. The guy was not smart enough to leave it alone. <laughs> <laughs> Which precipitated this next story. Uh, and he, he, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, well, who is my neighbor? Now, this is the question is, what's the minimum that I have to do? Right. right. Come on. Basically, I don't, I don't go way out of my way just kind of help everybody. Yeah. I, mean, I, I just said, who is my neighbor? Come the on. Side right there. There's a guy on that side. Is that all i got to do? Okay. Nope. <laughs> what's the minimum? So Jesus answered this once again. He did this by telling the story. And uh, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. He fell among thieves. They stripped him of his clothing, they wounded him, and departed him, and they left him half dead. Now by chance a certain priest came down the road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. Then a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And where he saw, when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him and he bandaged his wounds and pouring on the oil and the wine and he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day when he departed, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said to him, take care of him and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. So once again, back in your face, another question. It's not who is your neighbor, Who's going to be a neighbor to people who have a need? Right. Right. That's different. Mm -hmm. So which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? Jesus is telling the story. He's answering the question this, this man is asking. Maybe he's insincere, but Jesus is going to talk to him. He's Jewish. He's a lawyer. Right. Okay? Legalist. Jewish are pretty legalistic anyway. This is a legalistic, legalistic <laughs> guy. And uh, I believe that everything that Jesus said, nothing was without meaning. Right. He wasn't just making stuff up. He was telling stories that, if you think about it, would speak to you about answer questions in your life. And uh, as I heard this, this friend of mine here recently share about this, he, it kind of just struck me what was maybe really going on here. And... Uh, he says, a certain man going down the road. The man was at it. Trying to tell the story of what's happened to mankind. It could represent all mankind, because Adam was in that, we're all in, in Adam, you know, that sort of thing. And he's traveling from Jerusalem, which by definition is a place of peace. Shalom is about peace. So this is the city of peace. 
And he's going to Jericho. If you know your Bible history, it's a place that's cursed. Why is a man going from a place of peace to a place that's cursed? And anybody that goes there, you're cursed. Why would anybody do that? He struck, once again, it didn't mean as much to me until he pointed this out. And I thought, that's exactly what it is. He's going, he's traveling in the wrong direction. He's leaving something of security and peace, do his own thing in a place of curse. Uh, thieves came and they beat him up. And the Bible says it's the devil and his demons who come to steal and to kill and to destroy. Well, that seemed to be appropriate here. That's kind of what happened to this guy. He's got, because he's left this place of peace and he's going to this place of curse thinking he's going to do his own thing, he gets beat up. And we've watched this happen thousands of times in people's lives. Mm -hmm. Yep. And they not only wounded him, but they stripped him of his clothing. And that echoes all the way back to the garden. We, were, we had no clothes to start with, but God covered us. These people uncovered him. He's now an uncovered person. And that's no, any way you want to think about that. I'm thankful in Christ that as believers, we put on the whole armor of God. Amen. We can be well dressed. Thank God for that. And it said that they left him half dead. Right. Not all the way dead. <laughs> Just mostly dead. Yeah. Just half dead. I'm thinking, isn't that a description of everybody that's lost in this world? I mean, they're physically alive. They're still walking around out there. I mean, if they're not dead, we, you know what I'm saying. They're still alive. But they're dead. That's why they got to be born again, because they're dead. They're dead in their trespasses and sins. And they left him in that state. He's half dead. I'm thinking this is a this is a picture of the world. Mm -hmm. Yes. People that don't know Jesus. So as I'm thinking about this, a priest comes by and said he didn't help. Which may represent Abraham and his covenant. Come, you need to understand he's talking to a Jewish man who knows the law. Right. He's a lawyer. Maybe it represents Abraham and his covenant which there were a lot of promises and blessings that went along with Abraham, like Abraham's seed and heirs of the promise and all that sort of thing. Salvation was not one of them. There was no redemption, eternal redemption. And the issue here is eternal life. That's what the man asked about. What do I have to do to have eternal life? And he's telling you, yeah, we know Abraham's a great guy and everything, but he can't help you. Right. When you're talking about this subject, he can't help you. And goes on the other side because it's not eternally redemptive what he had. And then a Levite comes by and he passes on the other side, and, which may be Moses, the keepers of the law. Which showed people, the law showed people what's right and wrong. Probably only frustrated us because now it's been pointed out. But once again, no redemption. Right. You know, I got to, every year I gotta bring my land back again this year because I guess last year's land covering didn't work anymore and I messed up again since yeah. then because I'm not I'm not totally forgiven. I have to there's this constant reminder of my sin because I have to keep bringing my land yeah. to be sacrificed. Because there's no eternal redemption right. through the law. Yeah. The law tells us what's right and what's wrong. I get it. But he can't save you. Right. Come on. Just can't save you. John chapter 1, verse 17. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. We just need to understand some of these small things because there's a lot of people, let's go back to our own Jewish roots. I'm thinking, I don't have any Jews. <laughs> I mean, I. I I did have a grandfather whose name was Robert Abrahams. He could have been Jewish. But, <laughs> but personally for me, I don't have any Jewish name. Right. And me trying to go back to that because I'm thinking, why would I go back to something that couldn't redeem me? Come on. If there's something better, yeah. why wouldn't I go with the thing that's yeah. better? Yeah. You know? So, uh, another story. Put a pause there. We'll be back.
Matthew 17, verses 1 through 5. This is uh, Jesus and his disciples on another day. Now, after six days, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John, his brother. He led them up on a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. I don't know what that was, but I mean, it must have been glowing right. I don't know what it was, but I'm, I'm sure these thought, oh my God. I don't know what's going on, but boy, I sure am glad I'm here. And uh, his face shone like the sun, his clothes became as white as the light. And not only that, Moses, the law, and Elijah, the prophet. The law and the prophet were there. They appeared to them, and they're talking with them. I think, oh my God, I'm so glad I'm in this thing. I've got to be, be there with them. The three biggies all met together, you know, like the joint chiefs of staff, you know, and they're all meeting together. And we're, and we're going to be a part of it. And Peter answered, said, Lord, it is so good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And if it wasn't big enough, God decides to join the party. Because <laughs> while he was still speaking, behold, a, great, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and suddenly a voice came out of the cloud, This is my beloved Son. The next two words are important. Hear him. This is not about Abraham, or, and this is not about Moses. It's not about the law. It's not about the prophets. Hear him. Right. So I'm thinking God came to the party to try to straighten out their theology, which yeah. is we always want to try to add this new covenant stuff to old covenant stuff. And it's like we shouldn't really do that. We should learn anything we can from the old yes. covenant. But understand the new covenant, Jesus came to give us a better way, better covenant, better promises. Let's go with that. Come on, yes. come on. And that's what he's trying to say. He, and he, you know, we're, we're, he's tr still trying to answer this man's question about the Good Samaritan and, and all that sort of thing. So we get back to that. And, and understand something. In, in the world, in the Jewish mindset, there were three groups of people. There were Jews, and there were Gentiles, and there were Samaritans. The Samaritans were apparently a part of, they had come partially from some of the tribes of Israel that got separated from some of the others. And if you remember, uh, Jesus met, meets a woman, a Samaritan woman, at the well. Right. And she says, well, we worship on this mountain, but you all worship in the temple. And, and you know, I mean, she had Jewish roots. Please understand, Samaritans had Jewish roots. They were kind of like half Jewish, half not Jews. That's who they were. And the Jewish people didn't appreciate it very much. So it's, you know, in this story, you think, oh, yeah. We're going to make the Samaritan guy, he's going to be the hero of this story. <laughs> Great. We know Jews should be the heroes of these stories. Only the Jews didn't, they didn't come off so good. Yeah, they did. But the Samaritan did. Yeah. But there's a picture here. Samaritan's not Jewish. He's not Gentile. He's kind of in between. He, he, he can draw strength <laughs> from either one of these things. I'm not sure it's not representative of Jesus Christ came to save the whole world, not just the Jews. He came to save the whole world. Yep. And it might be actually representing people like you and me who had the best of best of both worlds. But anyway, the Samaritan, not fully a Jew or Gentile combination. I looked it up. According to what I looked at, there's still about 840 Samaritans still in the world. I don't know who counts this stuff. <laughs> there are people in the world who still claim to be Samaritans. It's a very, very small group. It was always a small group, even back then. There were more Jews, more Gentiles than there were Samaritans. But if you'll notice, from now on when you read it, you run across that word Samaritan, you'll think about this service. Like, okay, that's a really special group. They're kind of like half this and half other. So, uh, he pours in the oil and the wine. He takes him to the innkeeper. That's us. That's where God brings people. It's places like this. Who can, even though Jesus has 
brought him back, poured in the oil and the wine, taken care of him, paid the price. And if it costs anything more, don't worry, just put it on my tab. This is Jesus talking. But he's turned them over to the innkeeper. <laughs> this is just a picture, baby. And this says to me that there's more to salvation than somebody that we saved because this guy needed lots of different things in his life. He needed to heal a lot of different things. He's beat up. He's stripped naked. He's, he's broke. He's broken down. They robbed him of everything that he had. I'm thinking, I've seen this guy. I've run into this lady. You know, not physically, but spiritually. I, I understand who this person is. And Jesus wants to touch their life. And you're then you're going to turn them over to other people to take care of them. Right. And he said, and I'll pay for it. Absolutely. From what I understand, a denarii in those days was a year's wages for a common laborer. They gave him two of them. And he said, don't worry about it. I'll take care of everything. You know I will. Apparently I have a good reputation. So, what I've concluded from all of this, he told us to pray for his kingdom to come. For his will to be done on earth after this event. And uh, the biblical teachings of Jesus, the Word of God, I believe, are the answers to racism, to the sexual divide, yep. to international conflicts, to marital family issues, to health and financial problems. And it's all about coming out of a dark kingdom yeah. and getting into the kingdom of light. Come on. It's not about our groups better than your group. It's not about any of that kind of stuff. All the stuff the church argues and fights about, none of that is what this is about. What this is about is trying to help people get out of a dark place, testify to them there is a better way. Let me, let me show you. I want to introduce you to my friend Jesus. He's the one who can save you. He's the one who can, who can make things right. You'll make that kind of a decision that will be met with the divine encounter. And that, has, and that has, as you continue on with the Word of God and the Holy Spirit's going to be energizing you. Uh, you're going to be holy. Well, I don't have to do it on my own because i got a Holy Spirit in me which is going to make me to be like that. When I had an angry spirit, it made me angry. Well, wonder what a Holy Spirit does. Hopefully the same kind of a thing by its name. Tells me what's going to do. So, I just thought maybe on a day like today, um, Let's, say, let's just pray this. Not, not the Lord's Prayer. Just, let's just pray a part about for His kingdom to come. And His will to be done. Yeah. On earth like it is in heaven. I know this church prays for the lost. So on your board, it's a little bit and then we pray for it. What we're really praying for is for His kingdom to come. Yeah. And thereby, the possibility of His will being done more and more on the earth, yeah. just like it is. So join me in prayer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Before you pray, yes. can you pray? I just thought I would carry that perspective. Mm -hmm. 